the way it is, the breathing of the body, the posture, sound of silence, consciousness, conditions are the body, the feelings, perceptions, volitions, consciousness. The condition phenomena. Condition phenomena is impermanent. Nature is impermanent, anicca, and dukkha, unsatisfactory, and anatta, not self. Now this, this is a, a reflection on the way it is. This is contemplating Dhamma, or the way things are. And then with that, that is a kind of having recalled that, that our refuge is in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, then we can begin to look at the way we tend to react emotionally, the attachments and to this and that, fears and desires, the compounding, the adding to, the compli- uh, making complicated, uh, seasoning everything with our fears and desires, projections on creating a, a illusions, artificialities. This comes out of ignorance, not knowing Dhamma, not having any refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Then we we live in a make-believe world, in illusory realms of our own fears and desires, opinions. So the world is an illusion, and, and the world in Buddhist, in, and when we talk about the world as in terms of Dhamma, is the what we create out of ignorance in our minds. It's not people or places or things as such. It's not countries or planet, but it's it's the delusion we we create in our mind the world we create we are the demiurge the creator of the world when we stop creating illusions then we see dhamma we see things as they are then in, when there's when there's dhamma then there you know, is no suffering because we don't, we're no longer creating the conditions for suffering. But as long as we don't realize Dhamma or the way things are, then of course our life is just uh, in this kind of running around, trying to find happiness, trying to get away from suffering. Now recognize that the nature of consciousness being born and the sensory realm that we're living in is this way. The human body is like this. It's a sensitive organism. Uh, it has sense organs. It has eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, a brain, feels, and and we we feeling uh, is that we're attracted and repelled by what impinges on our senses. That's the way it is. Sensory realm is this way. It's it's, uh, the objects of the senses. If If we don't understand it, we're always being pulled to the objects of the senses or repelled by them. And then some of you have terrible problems with with just be stay, not being kind of preventing yourself from running after sensory objects like the uh, children's farm the garden shop at the children's farm and you sit here I imagine some of you sit here and you 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 think about the cheese and chocolate that awaits you down there just a few steps away you could sneak down by all these things for sensory pleasure, isn't it? They try and even imagine it here where they say it's not you have to think about it and just the thought of 
some kind of sensory delight, some pleasant taste. We can become obsessed with it, and it pulls us. We're pulled out into seeking sensory satisfaction, sexual desire. When we start fantasizing about uh, sexuality, we get excited and we, we're pulled out. We're not mindful anymore. We're lost in the excitement of those kind of images and fantasies, expectations and hopes. Wanting to listen to pleasant, to, to music or to, to entertainments and to just become absorbed into the objective realms of the object of the senses. And that's the way it is. They're attractive and they're repulsive. We hope, we, you know, we fear getting stuck in some with uh, sensory objects that are ugly or painful or unpleasant. And we hope that we'll be able to get hold of, possess, own the objects that please us, that are beautiful and pleasing, pleasurable things that that we like and want to to absorb into and possess, attach to. This is just describing the sensory realm. The, that's what it is. It's not nothing wrong with it. I'm not criticizing. I'm just pointing trying to point out how it, uh, what it is. So you can, because we have this reflective ability, we aren't just helpless victims of the sense realm. If we were merely sensual beings, and that's all we were, there'd be no way out. We'd just, we'd just have to go through the everything. There'd be no possibility of, of any, of transcending it. We'd just go around in it with no even hope or thought of transcending it. But the very th fact that we can conceive of a transcendent and realize a transcendent way is the proof that the sensory realm is not what we are. We are not sensual beings. The senses are not self. The body is not self. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, brain are not self, they're not me, they're not mine, they just, they're like the flowers, the trees, they, they're sensory organs, sensory conditions that were born and die, they are the way they are, but they're not, we're no longer creating an illusion that we are these things, we are the senses themselves or the sense objects. We can transcend our own eyes and ears, can't we? If we were just eyes and ears, we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to reflect on our eyes and ears. The fact that I can think, there are two eyes in my head. They're like this, and I can I can uh, contemplate just the the sensation of my eyes right now. I can feel my eyes, but the feeling of my eyes in my in my face, I'm I'm aware of now. I can contemplate the ability to see, and uh, the objects of sight. Now that is a reflective ability of the mind, which uh, means that the eyes are not self; they're merely organs, sense organs in nature, where the unawakened human being thinks his eyes are his and the objects of the eye these are these are my my these are my things my house my car me and mine everything is 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 uh, labeled as mine or not mine I'll say an animal doesn't have a reflective mind so so say the cat can't contemplate its own its ability to see or its body. A cat is a cat. It's become a cat. It, it's fulfilling its karma as a cat. 
it cannot transcend the feline condition. It can only fulfill it and be it. But the human condition, since it's not an animal condition, even though we, we have a lot in common with the animals, we transcend animality. The animality of our bodies and instincts. We're not that. That's not what we are. We, because we can observe it, reflect. It doesn't mean that we don't have those desires or those conditions. We aren't affected by that. But it means that we... Uh, transcend it. We know it as a something that arises and ceases because we are reflecting on the way it is, on Dhamma rather than becoming human beings even. We're not, we're not trying to become human beings anymore. In the Samana life this holy life is to transcend our human karma no longer to identify even with uh, the perception of human of being a human being. This outgoing energy, the kind of the kind of exuberance of our human state, is always kind of out looking for something to do. Restless energies, always going out to seek or to kill time or to do something. Uh, note this, this kind of this terrible restlessness that we suffer from. So that in the restraint of monasticism is a, it's 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 like putting ourselves in a corral to break this wild nature. Like a wild horse, you have to put into a corral, and it goes berserk. It it goes crazy when you put it in when it's used to just following its wild nature out in the plains or the mountains and going and doing what it wants to do, then it's captured and put into a corral, into a pen. And it, at first it goes absolutely berserk, wants to get out. And then, just by patience, eventually it calms down and then eventually you can take that horse and train it so that the horse isn't just wild anymore, it can be used, it can be of service, it can be of use to others. That's what we're doing, say, in with our mind. They train we're we're breaking through that wild selfishness, that desire mind that just wants to do what it wants to do, follow habits, follow desires not have to say no. So we the, say the Vinaya, the monastic discipline, the retreat situation is like a, a pen or a corral. A, a, it keeps you uh, imprisoned. It's like a prison. And, but it's meant to be this way. Not as a punishment, but as a, a way to break through just the wild momentum of habit and desire. That, that takes us into all kinds of realms of suffering and misery. So you have to recognize uh, the, the tendency to, when at first you're, you're contained and restrained into a discipline, you maybe intellectually you like the idea, you're all for it, you know you need it. But emotionally, and when your restless energies are such that you... You resist, you want to get away, you want to run away, you want to scream or do anything, get out of this prison, of this pen that you're in. Let me out. I look at some of you and I see kind of this, this, this raging horse. Let me out of here. I want to get out. I want to go to the cock and bottle. To the garden shop. This chance to go into Hemel Hempstead or Birkenstead or gosh, a real a trip to London would really be nice. Any kind of anything to do, any any distraction. Because the the uh, 
the wild nature is that way. It's outgoing, always trying to to uh, run away, seek some something that to absorb into, seek an object to be reborn again, to follow the habit, momentum of habit, desire. But the training of the Samana then is to try to stay within the limit, within the pen, within the corral, and to patiently, to learn how to be very patient and how to calm the mind, how to calm yourself down, to give up, to say, I'll just stay here forever. I'll just surrender to this limitation. My intention just to give up. I give up to this limitation. So that you you have to, uh, up, you know, to, to note the limitation, make it a fully conscious acceptance and surrender to it. Not just a kind of half-hearted uh, attempt to do so, or not really understanding how to do it, just kind of thinking of it in in not, not very serious or profound way, you you don't really understand what's happening to you. Like uh, uh, Sister Rojana wanted to get out of the pen and she was blaming everybody for keeping her in it. And you're trying to force me to stay and you are... And that's not, that's not right, is it? Not, not a matter of forcing people to stay. But it's to note that this is what, what it's all about. You're, you're here to remain within this limit in order to, to see how, what, what happens, what the, the mind, how it resists, how it wants to get away, wants to be free, doesn't want to be hemmed in, don't fence me in. Wild Western cowboy. We're usually a lot of cowboys, aren't we? When we first come into the Sangha, there's wild men and women. We think we're so civilized, but we aren't. We're just wild people. undeveloped conditioned is about all the best you can say we're conditioned in certain ways but we're still wild we're not we're not in charge we don't understand we have no wisdom to see we're merely uh, kind of conditioned programmed into into doing things a certain way and most of us come from fairly kind of privileged background, middle class background. So we're used to having a certain amount of luxuries as just taken for granted, like tea and coffee at our beck and call, have things around that just, uh, you know, when we want them, when the middle class type of family, isn't we, we expect life to be comfortable and have a nice high standard of living things around avail easily available is how we've we're conditioned that's why last night I was emphasizing the importance of of bringing acknowledging the requis the uh, the four requisites on their most basic level and that helps a lot to see what being middle class is about helps me anyway when you think of rag robes and fermented urine and uh, my middle class mind shudders at that. Oh dear, how dreadful. I want to get, you know, I want, don't want to wear rags or drink fermented urine. You've got to have, you know, decent quality cloth and, and this and that. And you have to have the, you know, good medical treatments. You have to have a proper kind of shelter and uh, good nourishing food 
when a monk or a nun gets sick, we send them to the doctors. Usually the doctors say, well, you should, you should eat in the evening and have sex. <laughs> doctors, medical profession, doesn't, do not understand monasticism or holy life. They think that all your problems, physical problems, are due to um, celibacy and not eating dinner. So it doesn't give you much confidence in the medical profession. Now when you are in a restrained, in a, in, you have to watch these desires die away. And you feel sometimes this sense of loss and sadness because being wild and free is quite, has, it has a certain uh, pleasurable quality to it. Being able to do what you want, being free to go and do what you want. And, just knowing that you can, you're, you can just do what you want. You're not bound by anything. It's even a kind of romantic image, you know, the free spirit that just is not bound by anything. Free to just do what you want to do. Go where you want to go. Say what you want to say. That sounds like freedom. And that uh, is a very uh, kind of pleasant and inviting image to the mind. So that in this life you feel a, a sense of, of uh, sorrow a lot, a sorrow and grief and sadness because these desires are dying away. You have to let them go and there's this, this inner death that's taking place. Your desires are ceasing and dying away. And when you're very much identified with desire, you feel sometimes you, you are dying, that you are losing something. And then we tend to go into doubt. You think, this, this is a, I've got to get out of this place. I've got to leave. I've got to get away. This is a, this is an evil thing. We can even think of being a Buddhist monk or not as an evil thing. We read something like, you know, the the prophet like Ahil Gibran and Krishnamurti and some of these inspiring works about freedom, following your heart and loving everything and and this very inspiring type of message and and then we think of uh, the Vinaya, don't do this, don't do that. This is a Tulajaya, that's a Sangadi saying. <laughs> Dukkana, celibacy, and think of celibacy. Well, God gave us a, this ability to procreate the species, the pleasure. These are God given gifts. We should be out and kind of enjoying it all, not suppressing it, holding it back. We should. Just sing and dance and be a free spirit. And that's a, a very kind of romantic image. But by letting all those desires go, those those feelings, those attitudes go, not suppressing. We're not we're not suppressing is is uh, is done through fear and aversion. But through understanding, we let go of those desires, those ideas, and more and more we we find say, this. Uh, tra we realize a transcendent, the transcendent truth, rather than just being caught up in these uh, exciting or attractive conditions. Because the whole purpose and aim of the holy life is the realization of transcendent reality, of dhamma, of truth. And the beauty of it lies in the fact that that you don't need to be free and do what you want. You can just sit, stand, walk, or lie down, just with breathing, just with the way things are. One is free. One doesn't need to to go out to the cock and bottle, or to a restaurant, or to an exciting place, or to a 
mountain top or any place. There's, there's no longer that need to go uh, to places or do things to be entertained or to feel free and happy because you find true peacefulness and contentment with Dhamma, with the way it is, rather than with a condition that uh, you have to try to, uh, that you attach to. So this outgoing tendency of desire, seeking things, looking, looking for the right person, for the perfect place, for something or somebody or some condition that will fulfill me. That's, that's the desire body, the desire mind. Desire is that way, dangha. It's, it's always looking for something. It's, it has no kind of permanent soul or anything. It, it's, just, it's just a habit of the mind. But it's 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 always looking for something. If you if you identify with your desires, then you're always caught in this kind of look going out to find something, having to get something. So desire always leaves us with a suffering of some sort. Even when we get what we desire, the desire still operates. We want something more. It doesn't it, desire is never it can be momentarily kind of gratified is the best you can do. The most you can expect out of following desire is a kind of momentary gratification. But then it all starts again. You want something else or more of what you want. So desire as an end in itself can only lead us to soka paritewa tuka tomanasu payasa. That's why in the in meditation, like sitting posture, you're you're training yourself to to surrender to a posture of the body, stillness of sitting. At first, isn't it? When we first start sitting, we feel really sometimes just uh, we're going crazy because we the body is not used to being still or sitting still for very long. So you train it. You 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 don't you don't beat it up and force it, and brutalize it, and make it sit still. A kind of an act of brutality. You you train it like to to break a horse, the wild spirit of a horse. You can't do it through brutalizing it, through beating it. You have to to break it through. Uh, Training it through encouraging, through through uh, getting its confidence. But if you brutalize a horse, it just becomes. It, you might break it, but you 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 ruined it. It's probably become a a useless creature, depressed and miserable animal. So we're not here to kind of just to to beat up to brutalize, to force and suppress and condemn the human body or ourselves in any way, but to train, to encourage, to to be very patient. You can see a lot of damage you do when you try to force your body to, to make your body do what you want it to do before it's ready to do so. And a lot of you have ruined your knees and backs through a kind of willful forcing of the body. Meaning you you say, I want you to be like this and then you make it do what you want and that's that's brutalizing it. It's not training it. That's not leading it onward and, and being patient. You say, I want it to be like this now and then you try to make it that way, and of course the body is not ready for that, so it can only uh, be damaged through that attitude of willful desire, force. Lung Po Cha was 
very much uh, told me when I first went there, he said, just practice patience. And so I, I, I did, I practiced, I really determined to, to use everything for developing patience. I determined to endure what I didn't think I could endure. And I, I learned I could endure. I realized I, I was quite a resilient being and I could endure anything if I, if I made that determination. Where my desire mind and my ego, oh, I can't stand this, I don't see the point in this, I won't do uh, Grumble, grumble, complain, complain, I can't do it, I fed up. And, uh, that kind of stuff is if you believe it then you end up becoming a person like that all the, the rest of your life you're going to be a, a a wimp a grumbler can't do anything because I can't do it I just don't feel well enough and I can't stand it and not necessary so you, you don't develop Patience. And patience isn't willful patience, like, it's not like holding a gun to your head and making yourself do something. But it's, it's it has to be combined with, with, like, with metta, with kindness, and wise reflection, and a kind of training and guiding and encouraging rather than pushing and forcing. There's a saying in Laos, saying if you want to if you want to get a pig across a bridge, don't push it. Because if you try to push a pig, it digs in its heel, it won't move. Or if you lead it across, then it can get it across the bridge. So, so this is, if you try to push yourself, we're all pigs, aren't we? <laughs> if we try, if we just push ourselves, then we, we end up not getting anywhere. We're just stuck. Just the willful pushing and forcing ourselves, we end up getting stuck. We can't get anywhere with that, with that kind of thing. So patience isn't uh, a kind of bloody-minded stubbornness to, to kind of willfulness, but it is a gentle uh, brightness and willingness to bear with things, to develop a patient mind, to be able to endure things, to endure situations and endure restless feelings and pain and, and boredom and despair to put up with these things because if we don't learn to do that then we, we just uh, are always running around looking for something to, to uh, distract us or to to uh, to entertain us or please us and we never grow up we never develop when you're doing the walking practice uh, contemplate that the path that you're using the John Grom path it, this is your limitation surrender to that limitation uh, what, how do you surrender to the limitation by noting it you're not just kind of not just being idealistic saying I surrender but you're actually bringing into your consciousness that the path that you're walking for the hour is just this long and this wide and and that that this is this is the the place you are this is what you're doing and just do that reflect on the simplicity of just being able to walk walking in itself when when there's walking conscious walking is quite pleasant it's not unpleasant in itself Conscious, a walking, 
uh, being able to walk can be quite a pleasant uh, activity. It needn't be exciting or, you know, kind of, it's not fascinating or exciting the mind, but it is pleasant enough. It's not an unpleasant thing to do. If you're, if you're conscious of walking, if walking is a conscious experience, rather than a perfunctory, habitual one, that you, you're just doing, going back and forth out of some uh, kind of uh, determination to be disciplined, but not really being with what you're doing. You're working from an idea rather than reflecting on the way it is. You can approach meditation walking as, a, as an idea. You should do this. You should do this walking meditation. So you go out and do it because you think you should. And not be aware that you're doing something out of an idea, uh, out of an idea of that you should do it. And, the, and usually when we do something from that, we end up feeling quite averse to it or not really being with it, but just going through the motions, doing your duty, uh, making yourself do something, that you think you should do, does not bring joy or happiness into life. So even quite pleasant uh, experiences and, and opportunities sometimes are, are not really appreciated because we're doing them uh, as a, because we think we should or have to or must rather than, than really being with what we're doing. Like a, the conscious experience if, is a, uh, Consciousness is like this. We can, we're conscious beings right now. This is what consciousness is. So when we do things consciously, when then then our consciousness is is uh, this being a conscious being can is a is a is a blissful experience. But when we're doing things out of uh, desire and ignorance greed and fear and that, then then we find even pleasant and, and pleasurable things can be completely unnoticed or not appreciated. The desire mind's always going on to the next thing anyway. And you just, if you, if you follow desire and ignorance and desire, you're always, even something, even when you get what you want, then then you then you are thinking about what you want next or where you're going next. So you can't even when you get what you want, you can't really appreciate it very much because your mind will go on to the next thing. That's what it, it's all it, it ever knows how to do. That's all. That's the habit you've developed. So the 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 meditation, the, the sitting, posture, standing, walking, lying down to to surrender, to, to lie down, stand, walk, or sit in a fully conscious way. So that the sitting, the body sitting is in consciousness. This is your, your, your reflecting on the posture, the breathing of the body, the, any feelings that there are, the fact that this is your, 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 recollecting that this is conscious, this is what consciousness is like. You know, with reflections, on, say, on the four requisites, I sometimes I think you hear, you're looking at it in an ideal, uh, very idealistically, so you think, I should be someone who's content with rag robes and alms food and fermented urine. <coughs> I should be someone who's content with all that. I shouldn't feel any complaining. I shouldn't complain or I shouldn't feel negative about things. If people give me a, a roasted slug in my arms bowl and that's all I get for the day, I should be just totally grateful. Somebody drops in a, uh, a roasted slug or, an, or a toad's leg into your arms bowl and that's all you have and you should a good monk or none with it. Oh, thank you so much for your generous offerings. I'm just so delighted and happy to get this wonderful food from you and your generous act. 
That's asking too much, isn't it? <laughs> Is that what some of you think you should do? And with your, with, the, with your place you live in, you're given some kind of <clears throat> grotty little room with uh, that has, is very drafty and unpleasant, and you're supposed to think, oh, goody, goody, well, I'm so grateful for a shelter for the night. Thank you so very much. And then if you feel any complaining, you think, oh, what a grotty room, why do they have to give me this dump? That you're somehow not a very good summoner. I'm so happy and glad that I'm, for everything I'm given, do you think you should become that kind of a person? Or do you think, like, as they, uh, the lay people offer tea in the, in the evening and, and it's not up to your standard or it's not made very well or why it's too weak or whatever, <laughs> you're supposed you're supposed, to, you're, you're, you're supposed to think, oh, goody, goody, how wonderful it is to have this, this, this hot drink in the evening. I'm so grateful. Uh, and not feel, oh, they certainly did, did a lousy job of making this. <laughs> now, recognize, I'm not asking you to become somebody uh, a goody-goody kind of simpleton. I mean, it, we're not asking you to become a saint, but to, to observe how your mind is. So we're not trying to pretend and put on a masquerade of being humble and grateful. Uh, and and then feel guilty when when our minds grumble and complain about things. That's not what I, that's there's no wisdom in that. But we are recollecting, observing, reflecting on the way it is. So we we have the ideal standard of the four requisites. The uh, the the ideal is gratitude for what is offered. That's the ideal. So that's, a, that's an idea we have. Then from that idea, what we get, if it, maybe it's not what we want or what we like, but it is what has been offered to us within the spirit of, of Vedana. And then we can, we can be aware of, our, of how our mind reacts. The complaining, the 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 discontentment the the uh, guilt about it or the trying to pretend that we really are grateful when we aren't trying to be nice about everything trying to be a good sport uh, trying to be someone who's who's not causing any problems that we're, we're watching and observing these uh, how how our Habitual tendencies uh, react to various situations. Because through that recognition, you can, you can let go of it. You can't let go of anything until you actually uh, fully accept and know what, 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 it, what you're attached to. You can't let go as an ideal. You know, ideally, I'd like to be let go of everything. I shouldn't be attached to anything, is it? is a high-minded ideal. But life, let's say, on a practical level of survival and experience is like this. We, we, as much as we have these high, uh, these ideals, we have to, we have to uh, bear with the, the habitual tendencies that we have. And we can only let go of those habits through understanding them not through just dismissing them because they don't fit the ideal that we have. Sometimes uh, in this life you get pe people very idealistic, high-minded types of people become monks and nuns. And they, they feel unworthy of, because they do have complaining minds or they're greedy or they're, they're not grateful. 
they feel they feel guilty about it. They feel I'm not worthy of the robe and alms food because they 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 can't live up to the ideal. But I'm not asking you to become the ideal, but to use an ideal in order to recognize the way it is. You can you can let go of the habitual tendencies. If you if you know if, that they are anicca dukkha nata, and if you if, if you learn from them, so the ideal isn't isn't meant to be intimidating you and making you feel guilty, but it's meant to to be a standard that you use for reflection, not a position to take or or something to to uh, always feel uh, to, to always make you feel unworthy or inadequate as you've heard many times the, the Ajahn Chah used to say did you come here to die in the sense of, of dying dying let desire die let everything die that which is born die so you're, you're allowing all your loved ones to die, all the things you're attached to and identifying with, you're letting them go, you're letting them die. So there is this sadness. Uh, it can be quite terrifying sometimes, quite frightening when you when you experience in these inner deaths. So therefore the, the reflection on the on the refuges is the most uh, helpful way to to remind uh, and to remember that the refuges are refuges in in immortal reality rather than in conditioned phenomena. We say all that is mine, beloved, and pleasing will become otherwise. That's very sad, isn't it? When you think about that. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. All my loved ones will be separated from me. All that I love and cherish in this conditioned realm is going to leave me. There's something really quite sad about that reflection yet, and yet that is the way it is on this level of mortal conditioning that's just the, the way the mortal realm is it's, it's what arises ceases it's about division separation, birth and death coming together and separating it's, that's all this, this, this realm is about. That's what we experience all the time. It's, it is this endless birth and death, coming together, separating, beginning and ending. Experiences, when you notice it, when you're, when you're mindful and reflecting on the way it is, you see that conditioned realm is this way. It's always been this way and will always be this way. The conditioned realm can only be this way. It cannot be any other way. It's supposed to be this way. It's a good thing it is this way. And when you understand it, you don't want it to be any other way. Perfect. But when you're, when you don't understand the conditioned realm, then you always think it should be some other way. You think, I want, uh, this, give me an illusory world. Tell me you love me. Tell me you love me forever and that when we die we'll go to heaven and live in a paradise forevermore. Tell me that everything is going to be wonderful and happy and that I'll never have to get sick, I'll never experience pain. Say I'm going to have good health, uh, go to a fortune teller and hopefully the, the, she'll look into the crystal ball and she'll say, you my dear, you'll have good health, you'll die at the age of 95 and you will not suffer any pain. 
and you as you say live a life where you have wealth, success, happiness. Please tell me that life is, is going to be happy and wonderful. So this is these are the illusions of life we we, we try to create. I think like Sister Tanisara's uh, descriptions of her experiences in India, I mean, India is pretty, they don't make much an attempt to cover the uh, unpleasantness of life. They cover it over, just to look at, at a lot of unpleasantness that we hide away in, in our more cosmetic society, like here in Britain, trying to make things look nice all the time. So all that is mine, beloved, and pleasing will become otherwise is, is an important reflection. Not rather than a depressing uh, thought, the more that you contemplate that, the more you feel liberated by the fact that you're not, you no longer are going to seek refuge in the mortal realm, in mortality, in, in another person, in a place or convention or conditions of any sort. And there's a kind of joy that comes with, with that realization that you, you're not going to go around, you don't, you're not looking for something anymore, you're not trying to find something, get something to hold on to. Because the liberation is there's nothing wrong, and there's nothing, uh, there's nothing really wrong, there's nothing to fear at all. But not because, not to, to, to cling to that idea that there's nothing to fear, but to realize the true nature of things, that realization is the realization that there's nothing to fear. But it's not believing that there's nothing to fear. And don't take, don't go around there. Ajahn Sumedho said there's nothing to fear. Oh, I feel so much better. I've been frightened for so long. Ajahn Sumedho said there's nothing to fear. Phew. I'm so relieved. I really like that. If you don't, you've not made any attempt to look very deeply at anything. You're going to make a momentary relief. You think Ajahn Sumedho said that, but then you Maybe he's wrong. <laughs> That's why belief always is belief and doubt. They they go hand in hand. Whatever you believe, you're going to believe blindly. You're going to doubt. 